I'm Julia Chen, I'm a restaurateur living in the Cape Town City Bowl. My restaurant Hallelujah is situated right in the heart of the city. Over the last few years, the influx of young professionals has created so many new and exciting things to see and do. The rejuvenation of the city has been something really special to experience. There are some really beautiful suburbs in our neighborhood. Nestled below the iconic Table Mountain lies the Ranezich and Tamburskloch, filled with unique and beautiful homes. There's such a young vibe in the city, with an incredible blend of diverse cultures catering to everybody's desire. Within the city, there are so many genuine and passionate people, and you'll find them in places like the Woodstock Exchange offering everything from handcrafted works of art to a culinary experience hard to forget. For those who enjoy the outdoors, Lion's Head and Table Mountain are phenomenal places to explore. Living in the City Bowl has definitely given me my dream lifestyle, and this is my neighborhood. Good evening and welcome to episode 32 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zaman Dungwa Kumala. We're on day 61 of the national lockdown. And on this evening's show, we're going to be looking at the five real estate investment mistakes to avoid. I know a lot of us are probably thinking about venturing into real estate and you really want to make that first investment. Tonight's show is the one you want to be looking out for when you want to find out which mistakes to avoid and to help us better understand which mistakes to avoid. And you know, there'll probably be more than five, but here are the top five that you simply have to be aware of. I'm joined by Tarai Jack, who's the co-manager and partner at M5 Property Addicts. Good evening, Tarai. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hey, Zama, thanks for having me and uh, welcome to everyone else who's watching from wherever they are. So I think one of the big things that, you know, this certainly this lockdown has given people is the time to pause and think. And one of the things that they're obviously thinking about is their investment options. Some people are obviously considering going into property and that's why they'd be tuned into the Private Property Podcast because they want to get different ideas of different strategies or how to go about getting that foot into the property ladder. But today we want to look at what mistakes they should afford. Let's perhaps just go straight in. You know, what's the first mistake that you've seen, uh, you know, different property investment um, investors rather, or even yourself that you've made that you think our viewers at home should be aware of and trying to avoid? Yeah, thanks, Zamon, this one. So, you know, I, I'm fortunate uh, to be one of those people that, I've, that I 
actively involved in the property space. So I invest myself together with the company that I run. And alongside of that, I also have other people that invest with us. And the number one thing that I also realized when I was starting off is that I just didn't know myself. So it might come as a surprise and people are expecting to hear big things, but the reality is that if you actually don't know yourself and you want to invest, the whole reason of why we want to invest is basically, uh, basically about two things. Is that you want to put your money somewhere so that you could be earning some money today or tomorrow, right? And if you actually don't know yourself, then it actually don't, it doesn't mean that you actually know what you're wanting to get out of it, whether it's today or tomorrow. And the reality is now, if you are to look at yourself and understand who you are, are you a numbers person? Are you a people's person? What kind of a person are you? What are your capabilities? What can you do and what can you not do? That way you then be able to actually say, hold on, let me play in my strength. And within my strength, I can actually execute very easily without thinking what I can do. So let's, be, let's give an example. If you're an accountant, it just makes life easier to do numbers because that's what you are. That's your skill that you have. Uh, so that's the very big mistake that we actually don't know who we are and we jump on to do something that we're thinking is going to give us money and we realize I don't want to be like this. I don't want to rent properties. Or oh, I've already made money. I've already put in a lot of money into, let's say, a, a flip where you're buying and you're selling. But somewhere along the line, you're halfway through the flip and you realize this is not what I want. I want to keep this but the property is not a rental property. So that, that's the first biggest mistake that I've learned so far. And I think, you know, it's, it's probably one of those things that we don't think about, uh, as we were saying earlier, in terms of being one of the first things to essentially avoid. Uh, but more than anything, I think it's one of those things that certainly as viewers at home, you almost need to stop and think, okay, so what do I actually want to achieve? Um, especially right. when you're considering property, what are my skill sets? What am I good at? Am I more of a people's person? Am I great with numbers? And the moment you begin to understand that, it does help you then even look at the type of investment strategy that you'll probably want to take further down the line. So of course, then that, that first one is not knowing yourself. So you certainly want to avoid that. So doing that deep introspection and really being clear about who you are and your intention with your property portfolio or your property journey is important. Now, TJ, what would be the second thing that viewers at home should avoid? Well, if you now understand who you are, Zama, the next thing, the, the natural best thing is now to understand, okay, you've got missing gaps and we all have gaps. We all have blind views. We're not all perfect. So now that you actually know that this is where you are and it's okay to be where you are because not all of us, we are aware of what property can do. I'll give you an example. When I first bought my property, uh, it was about to live into that property. So there's a lot of things that I didn't do that you're supposed to be doing when you're buying a property for investment. So the best, best thing that you can do, which should be natural when you now know yourself, is to say, okay, fine, I've got these gaps. Where, how can I fill these gaps? And that is education. For me, education is very important. And some people who are at home now could be saying, TJ, do we need to go and get a degree? Do we now need to enroll back into school? That's not the idea. The idea is that number one, there is so much available content that is available in terms of books. There's so many people that have written books. I have uh, written book my, one, uh, a book myself. And over and above that, there are so many podcasts like this one where you can tune in and you can listen. And there is actually schools that are out there that teach people how to invest in properties. But I always say to people, you know, when you, are, when you understand who you are and now you are trying to figure out where are the missing gaps, it is always good that you gravitate or look for schools that are um, where the teachers are in those schools are not just teachers from um, uh, an academic perspective, but people who are actually doing it. Because what happens is that uh, people that are just academics, 
when you're in the property space, it's very, very um, practical that you need to get your hands wet. So if you're working with people or people that have never done what they are teaching you, um, it becomes very problematic because all they are doing is to giving you the textbooks answers, right? And when you're on the ground and doing it, everything is now different. So the second thing that I would really press on upon people is that, and I've always seen this as a mistake, even to those that are investing on the side, they're investing in things, but they actually don't have the education around it, or they're just not aware of how to do it. So I'll give you an example. Um, someone gives me, let's say, 100,000 to invest on a property. They have no idea where the property is. They don't know what I'm going to be doing with the money. So are you really investing? The answer to me is no, you are just giving me money. Now, on the other hand, let's talk about someone else who is going to buy their first two bed, one bath. And that's where I started off somewhere in my first two bed, one bath. What, what is that property about? What am I going to do with that? So if I go in and I get educated, this is where I'm going to start learning small things like there's different ways of doing property. It's not just about renting. It's not just about buying and selling. There is a whole lot that you can now do with property. So once you get the education, your level of awareness grows from zero to let's say 100. Then you look back again and you say, but who am I and what can I do? And you start seeing easier things and you start gravitating to certain things because it's who you are. So people go out into these seminars and they think, well, you can do a whole lot of flips. No, flips is good for that person who was telling you that flips are good because that's what gravitate and who they are. Maybe for you, it's not. Maybe for you, it's Airbnb. But how can you start the Airbnb? If you, if you get the education around Airbnb, you actually figure out that maybe you might not need to own a property. You can go and rent and you can do your Airbnb for as long as contractually it's allowing you to do that. Now, all of these options are available for us, but the biggest mistake is that we are not aware of it because we are not educated around it. And it is on ourselves, not to blame anyone else or any other system is upon ourselves to get educated. And that's such an important one. I think being able to make sure that you're not only holding yourself accountable, but really make sure that you take advantage of the different information that you find out there and really do take charge in your own education when it comes to property is so, is so important. If you're just joining us at home, I am speaking to Tarai Jack, who is the co-managing partner at M5 Property Addicts. And we're looking at the real estate mistakes you want to avoid. So of course, many of us are probably looking or exploring going into real estate investment. And perhaps we're not so sure about the different mistakes that you know are out there. So we're unpacking some of the mistakes that you definitely want to avoid. And you know, as TJ said, the first one is not knowing who you are and not understanding what your skill set is and how you can best utilize that uh, when you are building your property portfolio as you walk your property journey. And the second one is, you know, knowing how you can fill the gaps, understanding the gaps you have in your skill set or even in your knowledge and knowing how to adequately fill it is very crucial. TJ, what would you say the third mistake our viewers at home should avoid is? Um, the third one, Zama, is that um, a lot of us, we want to do it alone. Um, is that importance of having a power team? That, there you get it. So um, probably it's one of those, um, should I say, businesses, or not just a business, but could, you, it's an investment, right? And for that reason, it's actually one of those things where it is very much like a sport, right? Let's take an example like a rugby sport. Um, there is the ball and that ball is the goal, right? And we can easily uh, uh, put that as an analogy to say that ball is your property. There is so many players that is involved for you to just get that property. And um, from the start of getting the conveyors uh, to, to getting their tennis, to getting through uh, your builders and things like that, and that's the power team that we're talking about. But the more you grow, Zama, that's one component of, you know, don't do it alone. Mm. The second layer to that, Zama, is that um, 
we only know what we know. And even if we go into to get educated and to read books and things like that, our level of awareness is only going to grow to a certain level. However, when you start meeting other people that are also in the property space, this is why the private property does the private show, you know, you get a whole lot of people that are coming through. And this is the same reason as well why I also started off uh, what we now call M5 Property Art Diversity. And this is a community of like-minded individuals, people who are doing properties. They could be in different space. It could be Airbnb, it could be student accommodation. It doesn't really matter. But the point is that they're all doing property investment. From there, I can then meet John and start gravitating to John because John is doing Airbnb. And I don't need now to learn from ground zero, but now I know John, I can go and spend half a day at his house where he's doing Airbnb and I can learn a whole lot. So networking is very, very important. And this is where one of the biggest mistakes that we have, we want to do it alone. We are in our own little house and we are only in our own little corner and we don't network to actually just widen our horizon and our education on who is doing what. And by the way, many of problems that I've had in the, properties, in the property space, the more I've networked, all of those problems have gone away because I now meet specialized people who are doing what I am struggling with every day. When I get that problem, I know how to call on John because I've met John. I know what John does. And that problem all of a sudden falls away. So of course that power team is quite important and we'll definitely you know look at a different episode where we look at what goes into your power team or who goes into your power team it's such a crucial part in your property journey you want to make sure that you have the right set of people to help you navigate your property journey so we definitely will be doing an episode on the power team that should be uh you know part of what you you make sure you invest in on your property journey and that investment isn't always in money sometimes it's making sure that you have the right people you can reach out to the right attorneys uh perhaps the right people who are into construction if there's any type of work that's going to be needed the right people who are able to remodel your property uh the right plumbers the right electricians uh the right bond originators who are working with you so we'll definitely be sure to cover that topic in the coming weeks tj what would you say is the fourth um, mistakes that our views at home should avoid I think this is the biggest one, uh, Zama, especially when you have gone through all of the steps that I'm talking about. And by no means am I saying that uh, these are steps that one needs to get to from step number one to three, but it's a facet of things that you need to be uh, to be covering if you're wanting to make an investment uh, in property is, is, is a serious one. Um, the biggest for me, Zama, is that now we are in the crust of it, our feet is wet, and we are now at a property, at the actual property that we are, now we want to buy. Whether we are buying it in a different space uh, from where we are living or close by, it doesn't really matter. But the fact of the matter now is we are there now, we are wanting to buy this, we, we go and we see it. The biggest thing, Zama, is that when you are buying for an investment, your heart needs to be very distant away from you. It is a numbers game and emotions should never kick in at any time. Um, and this is where I generally say to people, um, the biggest mistakes here is we do not do our homework very well. Now, what do I mean by that? It falls into two facets. The first one is what we predominantly call due diligence, DD. And due diligence is just actually to cover everything, you, you almost like a private investigator. You yeah. want to know who owns this property. Why are they selling it? Um, if this property here that I'm buying, how many, uh, what kind of, um, um, how can I change it to, to be producing more income? If I'm to sell it, how much can I sell it for? So you predict all of those things given the information that you've got in your due diligence. But if your due diligence is not good, what's going to happen is that the moment you buy it, what you have missed in your due diligence is going to bite you, mm. right? And that's how you're going to lose money. And that's when we start saying uh, property investment is not good. And on that due diligence, what then kicks in as well is what we call running numbers, 
right? So we spoke about, you know, remove your heart away from it. You know, so you kind of like go into a property, leave your heart right at the gate there or in your car and you go in with numbers. So running numbers is very important. So because it's about investment, it's about money. Is it making money? I remember when I bought the farm where we almost, where we lost 5 million rand. Uh, when we bought that farm, it was for an investment and we were saying, hey, we're going to have chickens here and things like that, but we didn't run our numbers. So all of it was in the air, right? And it made sense. When we were talking about it, it made sense. But because now I'm doing business very differently where when I go and buy a property, whether it is a farm, whether it is a, a house, whether it is a factory, whatever you're going to be using it for, you need to be able to run numbers. So what are the numbers that we're talking about? If we're talking about property rental, and predominantly this is what we do in our business, and we want to actually understand what is the acquisition cost? How much money are we going to spend in buying this particular property? What is the cost of that money? So you need to cover that in. So it's 1 million rand for argument's sake. And there's going to be closing costs. How much are those closing costs? We, we, we spoke earlier on around uh, number two to say that you need to have the power team in your team. So your, your, your attorneys already needs to be already giving you an indication if you are transferring a property of X amount, it's going to cost you X. But mind you, the more you are working with these attorneys and you're giving them more work, the likelihood of you paying less and less is very high because you now have a relationship. And this is where our biggest problem is. Also, when we are doing investments, we are working with John, Peter, Susan, there's no relationships that we are forming. But coming back to the numbers part, so you, are, you now have your acquisition and you now go back and say, okay, what is the cost of money? Per month, I need to be paying 10,000 Rand. That's the cost of your, your investment. Now, at the back of that, you now want to say, how much rental can I collect? And you have included things like insurance and all of these other costs that you can include, municipality and all of that. And it's a 10,000 rand that you are having. You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a ballpark figure that we're giving. Then you are making 20,000 rand on that property, Zama, for rental. So you have factored in what if one tenant doesn't pay? What if five tenants doesn't pay? So all of a sudden, you are, you are kind of like round about at the 15,000. If you subtract your 15,000 from your 10,000, which is your cost of running that property, you're making some money, right? Five grand. So that's good money that you're making there. You've factored in maintenance and things like that, right? So on that perspective, it's a good property. What about the other way around? Where potentially your rental income was 9,000, but your running cost is 10,000. I so used to be... So sorry that you to interrupt, TJ. So essentially, you're saying that you know part of doing our homework is making sure that we also just run the right numbers. And I think you know coming from what you're even saying, it, it's very clear to me that we certainly need to do another show, a very different show, on what we mean when we say run the numbers because there are different. 100%. There's so many different ways to run the numbers. There's so many different factors to consider, and oftentimes people simply don't know. So even if you've got now an investor who's got a few properties under their belt, perhaps even advising them on different ways that can optimize costs um, in their property portfolio. So we do promise to add that as another episode that we will explore because understanding the numbers that we must run, and we talk about this all the time. We say run the numbers, run the numbers, understand the numbers before you make that decision. Make sure that the numbers also say that this is a good deal. But so many of us probably might not know what exactly we need to be running and what these numbers essentially mean. So we'll definitely be sure to cover that in a different episode. We're going to go for a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be looking at that last mistake to avoid. But as TJ and I was talking, you know, of A was saying that when you look at investing in property and exploring investing in property, there are typically more than five, um, you know, mistakes that you want to avoid. So we'll probably be putting in a bonus, uh, you know, tip or bonus um, issue that you should probably avoid just after the break. So when we come back, I'll still be speaking to Tarai Jack, who is the co-managing partner at M5 Property Addicts. We're looking at the five real estate investment mistakes to avoid. We'll be back just after this.
Welcome back to episode 32 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Zamantu Kumalo. I'm joined this evening by Torai Jack, who is the co-managing partner at M5 Property Addicts. And we're talking about the five real estate investment mistakes to avoid. Now, TJ, you're about to share that last mistake that we should avoid. Of course, to our viewers at home, if you've got any questions or comments, do send them through and TJ and I will unpack them. If you've made any investment mistakes that you want to share with our listeners and viewers at home, please do share them. And a lot of us learn from each other's mistakes. I think more than anything, we want to make sure that some of the mistakes that we've made, other investors don't make. So do send through those comments and questions. TJ, that last mistake that we should be avoiding when we're going down the property investment journey, uh, which one would you say it is? Yeah, thanks among that. Uh, so I think the last one for me is that I wanted to throw in for someone who is also not starting off, but potentially they have done four or five properties and they're now really looking at, you know, uh, building their portfolio. Um, and this was also a lesson learned from me um, when, when I was starting off as well, is that we tend to neglect, and it's not by, 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 by the fact that we choose to, but it just so happens that when you start buying your properties, you, you're buying in a particular area because you like it, or you're buying your property because maybe your first property, that's where you were staying, and then you moved on into another area. You've outgrown that property. And the biggest one for me is that we tend to neglect understanding the areas that we're investing in. So there are so many, um, there's so many uh, companies out there. Um, I can just drop in a few names that I favor to look into. So for instance, TPN is my favorite in these days. Um, I like the way in which TPN zooms in into a particular neighborhood and it tells me from an investment perspective um, what I am likely going to be seeing in that particular area. What kind of an area is it? Is it a growing area? What kind of trends of, or are happening in that particular area? So if I am being serious about my investment and I am wanting to grow the, my portfolio, is this the right area for me to be investing in? Do people actually who live in this area, are they good pay, payees? Do they pay well in, on time? Um, and there's data around all of this. So when I'm now buying, I'm actually making an informed decision, mm. right? But what if, if I've got an area too that I was earmarking on, or potentially I am just thinking maybe it could be a good area. Can I not now do a comparison with the area where I'm already investing in, and that could actually inform which area then I can go into. And um, that for me is, was a very big one because now I can literally go in in particular areas and I can heavily invest in them because I know from a, from a growing perspective, um, it's a good area for me. Is it a cash flowing area? Uh, or is it an, um, an appreciation of assets? Is it, why am I investing in that area? In such kind of reports like the TPN for me, it gives me that my uh, confidence so that I can jump into that area to invest in. Now, you know, TJ, we, we, we did say earlier on or just before the break that oftentimes there are obviously more than five mistakes and we'll add in a bonus sixth mistake that viewers at yeah. home should avoid. What would be that bonus sixth mistake that you think viewers at home should avoid when they're looking at uh, investing in real estate? 100% Zama. So, so the bonus one for me is that um, what normally happens to us, uh, and you know, if you look at all the reports, normally it's, it stipulates that um, the majority of people who are investing in properties, they get to number two and they kind of like get stuck there for a long time, or they get to number three and then they don't grow. And I've always wondered what happens or what happened to those people. And uh, I already lived it. The reality is that when you get to a certain level, we get scared. And, and I'm going to mention this to say that this is the biggest mistake that we have because we get scared too early in the game, right? We get that one bad tenant and boom, Zama, we want to sell. We get that one tenant who doesn't pay for three, four months and boom, we want to sell. Where is, 
in anything that we are going to do outside property or with property included at any given time, Zama, number one, there is risk in everything that you do. Yeah. Just waking up, you and me, it was very risky for us, but we mitigated that by just standing up, right? So in property alone, there is also risks that are there, but we now need to know how to navigate them. Mm. And the longer you stay in the game, that's number one. And then number two, the more you're also growing your portfolio, the easier it gets on the other side because now you have processes and you've got systems that you're working with that help you to navigate such kind of issues. And the bigger your portfolio, uh, the, the more it gets bigger, when one person doesn't pay, you don't feel it. Mm. Whereas when you just have your two bed, one bath, and one person does, doesn't pay, you're going bankrupt in two months time, right? Mm. So for me, that's the biggest one. And I write about that in my book um, uh, that I recently wrote, uh, Bed Dead to Property Mogul in two years, that we really get scared too early in the game. You know, it's like we are in love and that boyfriend doesn't pitch up when he said he is going to pitch up <laughs> and we're signing divorce papers already. <laughs> In their defense, the boyfriend should pitch up when he says he's going to pitch up. <laughs> but TJ, before we wrap, you know, you're mentioning yeah. your book. Perhaps tell us a little bit about the book and some of the issues that you tackle in the book. Yeah, so the book, well, well, I really wrote the book, um, uh, Zama, uh, the title might sound glamorous. Uh, it's not at all. It's right, right about, I looked at myself when I was starting off um, and uh, I looked at what were the, some of the obstacles that I faced. I poured out my heart into it from just being employed. When I started off property investing, I was employed. What were some of the other challenges that I had? But when I also started off Zama, I was in debt about that particular time of round about 5 million rand. So how did I navigate that to start being able to build the property business that I've, uh, I've built? And um, I had to go outside the box in terms of thinking what can be done. And I actually realized that there's quite a lot of people that don't know these things. Mm -hmm. So I've put all of those things out to the surface um, and hoping that you know those that are going to be uh, reading the book they will get the nuggets and then they can apply it in their own lives. So the book is really written around the challenges, how I managed it, and how can you actually do it yourself in your own personal life uh, in the chapters that I walked through from all the time when I was, uh, uh, when I was born all the time to, to where I am today, but really focusing it around property uh, because I think that property is one of those uh, uh, spaces where if, if you're doing it very well, it does not just bring you money on the table today, but it can really give you money and wealthy for the rest of your life, plus your generations to come. And, you know, for viewers at home, TJ, who might want to buy the book, how do they go about doing so? Um, the book is available on our Facebook page, uh, M5 Property Addicts, um, uh, that's, that's number one, or number two, it is on my personal page, which is www.taurajack.com. And we've got, you know, comments and questions coming in from viewers at home, and the comment here is from Gatea Kwa'akape, who says, I think my mistake was to buy properties in my own name. I'm still learning about buying through a company or trust. And Gatako, I mean, that's one of the mistakes that a lot of us, uh, you know, newbie investors essentially do. You buy those first few properties in your name. And sometimes it may have been because perhaps you didn't think you're going to go down the real estate investment option. Maybe you just thought, ah, I'll just have one or two and that's it. But then the property, you know, bug bites which is a thing yep. and it happens. And you realize that perhaps buying those first few properties may not have been the best things to do. We did promise, of course, that we're going to be bringing you an episode uh, in helping us structure our property portfolios and looking at the best ways, uh, whether we must use a PTY or trust and the different ways or the different pros and cons of using either one of those instruments. TJ, we're going to wrap it up this evening. Thank you so much for, for joining us. And of course, if people at home want to reach you, how do they go about um, reaching you? 
Uh, they can reach us uh, via our website, uh, www.m5propertyvarsity.com, and that's where we are. And that is Tarai Jack, who's the co-managing partner at M5 Property Addicts. We're talking about the five real estate investment mistakes to avoid. Folks, that's it for this evening. Until tomorrow evening, I hope you're staying well and staying safe. Of course, do continue participating in the private property uh, podcast competition that we posted details on just here below. On Friday, we'll be announcing who the lucky winner who gets to walk away with that 1,000 rand prize is. And I'm sure this prize, you know, will go a long way given that we find ourselves in COVID and really wanting to make a little bit of extra money everywhere we go. So do download the app and make sure that you send us that screenshot and you might stand a chance to win that 1,000 rand prize. Till tomorrow evening, stay home, stay safe, and we'll be back again tomorrow. Cheers. Thanks, Amar. Bye. Hi, I'm Khumad Zaboy, and I'm an entrepreneur from Soweto. So what has come a long way from a small township to a mini city of its own? So it has got some really, really nice suburbs, like Deep Cliff Extension, but the locals call it Deep Cliff Expensive. Orlando is known as a suburb that had the first brick houses built in Soweto. Orlando iconic games pirates, Villagazi Street, where Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu resided. To the west of Soweto, you find suburbs of Dobsonville and Plotia. These two suburbs are actually very cosmopolitan, fresh, young, and very new. Right next door to Soweto, we have a neighboring suburb, which is Aldorado Park. For a little adventure and a little fun, Soweto's got so many night spots, from the news cafe at Mamponya Mall, to your Villagazi Street Sakumzis, to just chilling at Chuff Posey just between the towers and having a simple bright face, Chisanyama. Something very close to my heart is actually seeing people move back into Soweto, growing businesses, remodeling homes. It merely says to us that Soweto is a growing city. There's way more to this place than what we think. Soweto needs to be discovered daily. I'm so proud to call Soweto my home, and this is my neighborhood.
Hi, I'm Nobuntu Webster. I'm an entrepreneur. I moved to Santon to pursue a dream. I've based myself in Santon because it's the gateway to Africa. The neighborhood of Santon is alive. It's alive with possibility. It's got the most amazing vibe. If you need to get anything done, this is the place to get it done. One of the things I really love about Santon is how it lights up at night. If those lights don't inspire you, nothing will. Santon is the richest square mile in Africa. It has everything from shopping in Santon City to five-star hotels like a Michelangelo for my international guests. It works for me to be here. There are so many designer stores. There's an abundance of clothes and everything else to choose from. Being an entrepreneur, I travel a lot, so it's really convenient to be able to get onto the Khao train and in 15 minutes, I'm at the airport. Business is important to me, but my family is everything. And that's why my family and I are looking to move into one of the suburbs in Santon. Santon has some of the most exclusive homes in the country, in places like Hyde Park and Sandown. A little bit less fast-paced is your suburbs like Bryanston and Livonia. Branson was a natural choice. It's got great open spaces, it's safe. My son's already at a really good school there. And Santon gives me great variety, from an awesome nightlife, to beautiful places for lunch, to spas where I can really relax and recharge. Things happen in Santon, and that's my neighborhood.